I were seeing the videos and stuff, you know, but this is the first time that myself, I can say, was been in something like this. And, you know, Na'au just started to fly. And some of us were on the road when those trucks were coming up, we just started for Oli, we started for Chant, some of the aunties over there just broke down. And it was really one of the, your typical pictures. Why you do this to us? Auntie slamming her fist on top of the vans, everything was, was Eha. You no, know, it was true Eha. Our chants became whales. You know, we we and just the whole feeling of it. But then we felt our energy after that. We were so, oh, so Eha. It was strange to me to have this feeling on Mauna Awakea. Because every time I go up there, we're there in Pule, and so the f feeling is, is a particular way. So to feel ourselves in this kind of energy in our sacred place, we know, oh, this is not Pono. This is Ali my Kai. Um, we then made our way up the Mauna, and we got up to the summit. We were blocked. There was actually a police truck and a ranger truck in the road. So as much as they like to say that act, um, you know, pro uh, protesters blocked the road, we never blocked the road. We were blocked. We were just waiting in line. <laughs> and um, we were in line for a long time. <laughs> and all their caravans came up. They in the back of the line, not our fault. Tell this guy, move it, we all go. Um, so you kind of see that in the videos and such too, but basically what began to push from there was just people's hearts came out. Um, you saw the change from down below to up there, because we know we're in Vawakua. We're technically not even supposed to be up here. But if we have to be up here now, then our presence needs to be Pono. Um, and so the best language is the language of our Pule, and our chants, and our Oli, our, oli, our Hula. All of that began to come forth. And then we tried to dialogue. We saw Billy Kinoi come out, let's all go! Yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, he just wasn't listening. He wasn't listening. It was just all this circle talking. Um, and eventually there was a move on, their, on his part, they said, you know what, okay, we're going to leave. And we thought, they're all leaving. No, he was smart. He removed all state. All state, county officials, all left. We never, we thought they're in the process of them leaving. We never see some of the TMT workers actually going up to vehicles um, past us and then driving ahead. So that's when we actually began to make our way on foot um, over to the TMT site. Uh, then that's when the fun little action happened, where I really met brother <laughs> Kaho Okahi. Um, I got hit by a car, and he helps, he was the only one of some of the brothers who was slamming to the truck, because I was stuck in the hood. So, <laughs> that'll wake you up. <laughs> and I was really pumped up and started making my way over to the site, um, after they stopped the vehicle. And I made my way over, I don't, I don't even remember how I got there, I didn't know where it was. Um, and then, once I finally found the site, it's all blank from there. You know, Akua, I really feel, lifted me across all that pohaku for get up there. For some reason, I guess I didn't have to breathe, I'm just go. And then from there, you can see the video, you know, just let Akua speak. Let our kupuna speak. And that's what I felt. You know, in the state, every, you know, I think we've all been in that part where you just start speaking and you don't even remember what you said because it's not you speaking. You know, kupuna really began to speak. Um, it was very high emotions that day. A lot of people have missed, uh, mixed feelings about how that went down. But what it did do is it, it did stop the ceremony. Yeah. We even were kind enough to help them pack up their chairs. <laughs> Get off the mountain. Um, but that presence of Aloha, I think, really, really changed the, the ball, the playing field up there. You know, they they're prepared to deal with angry people. They all got their zip ties. They're ready for it. But how do you deal with people who are quote unquote behaving and belong in that space? doing what, what is Pono. They don't know how to deal with that. They were not Makau Kau for that. Um, and so all that whole day, we stopped, you know, held them off for five hours and then closed their ceremony. They all left. No one got arrested. 
For us, that was proof in the pudding right there. That there's a tactic. There is something to this. It's a way of really, of truly falling in the ways of our kupuna and respecting the kapu of the mauna, the kapu aloha. Yeah. Um, and so that was that day. And now it comes to about 26 days ago, 27 days ago. Today is one month. So one month ago, wake up 7 o'clock in the morning, get a text message, uh, tractors are moving up the mountain. Kupuna just told me, get up and go. So drove straight up on the mountain. Uh, got as far as Pohalipohaku and they had blocked the road. Um, the road was closed. And so I said, well, that's why I was giving feet. And I started walking. They tried to stop me several times, but I just kept going. Uh, ended up walking for two and a half hours. Got over 12,000 feet. Um, already saw their trucks coming down. So it was the Eha that knowing that the tractors are up there. At that time, you know, um, I guess they opened the road. Uh, Ohokahi was one of when a few other of our Ohana came on up. We went to the site and kind of kind of engaged dialogue with the security guard that were there. You realize, okay, but in our Koleana, we need to come and start watching over this Mauna. So we had this was on a Tuesday, so we had set to come back on the Thursday to start uh, keeping visual on the Mauna. We didn't get that chance to hold Makau because the next morning I got a call. The tractors are moving and they're pushing flew up there again and this is the one if you got to see some of the footage when I was actually asking them where's your cultural monitors where's your archaeologist just calling them out on these things and it worked because their archaeologists and their their peeps wasn't there um, so right there you saw they actually packed up and they left um, and from that day there's from that day from right there there's been a 24 7 vigilance and presence on the Mauna keeping a watch over the Mauna. Um, and it just started from there. We just put the word out, the kahea to our people, you know. Hey, this is, we are at this point. We're not beating around the bush anymore. They're here. The tractors are on the mountain. All we need to do is leave and our kapohoi hoi will be ripped up. It is gonna start. Um, and mind you too, this is already, they're already almost a month behind because the actual original date the tractors were supposed to be moved up there that we were all we were all aware of was the day that Poliahu came. And the mountain was covered with a thick layer of snow. And particularly in this area where they're about to dig, the snow was seven feet deep. Oh Ho'ailona. Yeah. So that's what I want to kind of speak to is the matter of the Ho'ailonas that we have been seeing in this, you know it's it, it, our kupuna and our akua are paying attention. In that spot, the snow was so deep, seven feet. Because they were, they were pushing that day, they actually just pushed the snow to dig it out. And when I went walking down there, the snow was, was whoa, thick. Um, but it was perfect too, because prior to that, I had really hooky hooky as to a, how, what do I do? We were still in Makahiki. I was like, I can't, I can't engage in this, it's Makahiki. And then the snow came. Palinamauna, just long enough, we just finished our makahiki, all rose our ku, and boom, the snow opened up to the point that they were able to bring the, um, the tractors up. So the way things have been aligning right now is be, it's not just coincidence. Our kupuna are setting it up. And for me, when our kupuna are setting it up, that means we better be makaka, we better move on it. Yeah, because they are making ready for us in that realm. So, even up into the movement now, everything just seems to be falling into place. Our people are waking up, our people are seeing the collective, um, how do you say, the sense of unification. This is the, one of the biggest unifications oh, I definitely, I've ever seen of our people. And, you know, I feel it's because this is the last straw. Mauna Awakia, in the tradition of our kupuna, that is the pico of Hawaii. Everything that is our culture is because of this mauna. It's the mauna that our kupuna first saw that brought them here. Yeah? It is the foundation of wakea, making, um, coming to this mauna and establishing itself that made us now stay the birth of the kanaka of the Hawaiian on these islands. Um, so, 
with this, if they're able to do this, they're able to do anything. This is the peak or the highest of the high. Yeah, and they've already had their chances and they've already got onto there. They've already infected the people. So with this now, enough is enough. And we need to be makaukau. We need to get ourselves ready and conduct ourselves at our highest potential. The kapu of aloha that we hold on the mauna, that we are asking everyone that is connected to the mauna and wants to speak to the mauna to conduct themselves in that same manner, that has been both our shield and our spear. If we came in there aggressively the first day, we would all be gone. Now here we are a month later and our encampment still stands. In fact, we're really good. We, we're good friends with all the rangers. We're good friends with all of the police officers. That's quite <laughs> different. But it's because we're recognizing that a cup of aloha it gives us patience and compassion to understand these brothers that are coming to arrest us and these sisters that come to arrest us. We have to look deeper. Now we cannot just look at them on their surface because that's only one part of the story. When we look at them when they were coming to arrest us, what I saw was cuffs on them. They're not allowed to follow their na'au. They're not allowed to follow their heart. Do your job, arrest these people. So who really is a prisoner? Yeah. Yeah. And when they say Ohana, serious Ohana, one of the brothers walking in the line with us, his dad was one of the officers that came. Could you imagine the uki huki there? So we have compassion, understanding about this. It's a new, it's a different way. I know it's much different um, and it's very hard. And we've been questioned up and down. What is this kapu aloha thing? Right now, it's proof that it's working. Because here we are, one of the biggest gatherings and unifications of our people. And yet even the day on the arrest, if you watch the arrest, 31 people arrested on the Mauna. Not one cuss word. Not one fist raised in anger. None of that. Maybe that's what we needed to see in order to spark and get everybody moving. But that we respect the traditions of our kupuna so much that we would not even allow that to sway us. On the Mauna, is the most sacred, one of the most sacred peoples of Hawaii. How do you conduct yourself in a sacred way? We didn't allow ourselves to turn our light off. Yeah. To engage with these. We stayed in our light and it's become infectious. Yeah. A positive infection. Keeping the light on for everyone. That's what's opened this up truly, the attention of the world. We have the whole world watching us right now. And like Arkupuna told us, I remember Arkupuna telling me when I was young, there's gonna, that day is going to come where the world is going to look to Hawaii to learn what aloha is. So now we have the world's eye. We better be the prime models of what aloha is. And again, we're not talking about just the ushi ushi lavi dabi aloha. <laughs> so again, that's only one aspect of that word. But everything that aloha represents. Aloha is a way of thinking. To acknowledge one's breath of life, alo to alo. To see everything that they are, to understand everything that's happening, and then make a, a decision how to engage with one. It's hard. It's super, super hard to do. Believe me, I've been tested several times in the Mauna. But having this couple, that I am holding myself to abide by keeps me in check. Soon as I start to waver, okay, pull me back in. That's what a kapu is. A kapu is a standard that is set. We decide what standard we want to set for ourselves. So we're setting the bar high. And it's to conduct ourselves at our highest level, highest potential, to speak well, to speak truth. In this movement, one of the greatest things is we know hai nothing. 
We keep hearing TMTs actually, as we're hearing from the community, people have been approached by TMT with big dollars for come up and infiltrate our camp and get dirt on us. You can just go to YouTube and you're gonna find out everything. We put, <laughs> there's no secrets. We're operating completely, completely in the light. So it's harder for them to touch us. What are they gonna do? We're speaking from our heart. We're speaking from the out. We're speaking from Pono. And that has been one of the most beautiful things um, about this movement. As I say too, if we're really looking forward to to building a nation, how will we build that nation? Will it be a nation founded upon just legalities and policy, or like many nations founded on war or bloodshed? I don't find that to be very honorable. For myself, if we're going to build a nation, I will be part, be proud to be part of a nation that builds itself on truth, on love, and respect, and true unity. So, Mauna Awakea started off as trying to stop a telescope development on a sacred place. But it's becoming the opportunity for Kanakas to step it up. And we gotta take full advantage of this opportunity. So with this, we actually say, Mahalo TMT for giving us a good reason to step it up. So, Mahalo no no kako. Aloha. Aloha me kako, wawo, loho kai kaduha. Uh, Andre just asked us to come up and kind of give a little scoops on, I guess, how we started this, how, we, how, it, how it all started. Um, so Lanakila pretty much covered everything, but I can talk a little bit, some fill in a little bit stuff um, for my part. Uh, I was up here, I was living on Oahu for 13 years, from 7th grade until Paul College. I graduated from the University of Hawaii Manoa in 2013 with my bachelor's in Olelo, Hawaii. In my last semester of college, I was taking an ethnic studies class with um, Pomeka E. McGregor. And the, the, the project for the semester was to cover and research a current land issue in Hawaii. Um, so being from Hawaii Mokupuni, obviously I wanted to do an issue that was on my Mokupuni because I knew that as soon as I graduated, I was going back home. And so at that time, and at this time as well, there's probably no greater land issue in Hawaii than Mauna Wakea. So that's kind of how I got uh, involved in it as far as you know just kind of going through the comprehensive the master plan the, um, all of the studies that they did looking at the lease agreements and things like that and seeing just how ridiculous it was um, and so when I came back home you know I was a little bit aware of what was going on so but I never really got physically involved until the October 7th uh, attempt at groundbreaking and the blessing um, it was like Lanakira said we went down there for for Pule that's all I knew. Um, I was actually here on Oahu on those days. Uh, I, I teach Hawaiian Medium Preschool, Punana Okona. And so we were on Oahu for staff training. Um, I had a feeling, it's like somehow the, the training is going to be on the same day. And it was, uh, training was Monday, Tuesday, and I think the groundbreaking was on a Tuesday. So I worked it out with my, with my uh, Luna that I can only be there for one day, then I got to go, I got to go back home. I got to go have Kuleana on the Mauna. I don't know what that kuleana is, but I know I get kuleana over there, I gotta be there. Um, so we went there, and like Lanakila mentioned, it was kule, it was all my kai, and then we got word that, hey, some guys, we can go up. We're gonna, we're gonna go up. Okay, let's go up. Um, and we got there, and uh, it was a life-changing experience, really, for me. Because, uh, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of these attempts at protests and stuff like that. And sometimes, a lot of times, it's just to kind of get your message across. Yeah, you go to sign, people hear about it, people see about it, and, and that's all. But that was actually one of the, um, kind of like one of the first in a long time where the, the purpose of the protest was actually fulfilled. Yeah, it was to stop them from, not, not from blessing it, but to stop them from breaking ground, from taking that OO and putting it into the Honua. Because the symbolism of that is that that's the first step of construction or destruction, yeah, and desecration. So we don't like them even get started. We're gonna stop them from the very beginning. 
Um, and as everybody knows that day, we were able to stop them. Uh, like Lanakila said, I met him on the truck as we was both sitting on the hood um, by one of the, the park rangers. We go right up to him, you know, not you know, not 45 mile an hour kind, but at a decent speed. And and I saw him stand in the road with zero fear and and just cool. And he and the guys in the, the truck, the windows rolled up and everything, and he stood right there and he said, cool. And the truck came up to him and bumped him, jump on top. I was right behind him. We got there and uh, we so we was on the hood and the, the truck actually continued to go, continued to drive. And so we end up back on the ground, we're holding off, we're getting backpedaling a little bit. And in the spur of the moment, we're not really thinking about, you know, okay, what's the, what's the best strategy here? We just get in front of the truck thinking that they would stop. Um, he never stopped. And so we had some other, some other guys um, who saw that. They ran up, they jumped ahead, and they lied in the middle of the road. And the, the truck went right up to them and stopped right before them. And so we, we stopped that. Lanakilo went ahead and, and ran up to the top of the, to the mountain, down to the site, while the rest of us kind of held a line because there were other trucks behind who were going to attempt to go through. And so I went out was, if you're not going to let us through, then we're not going to let you guys through. If anybody deserves to be there, it's the Kanaka. Um, and so, like I said, you know, we, we stopped it that day. Yeah, through a collective effort, we were able to stop the groundbreaking and the blessing. And so from that point, I knew that, okay, now we have a kuleana to stop this whole project. Because if we can stop the blessing, then we got to stop the project too. Because if we don't plan on stopping the project, they might as well let them do the blessing. Yeah, so that things can go perhaps as good as possible, as pono as possible. But again, the mindset is that this is not going to happen. We're not going to allow it to happen. So from that day forward, I knew that the time was going to come where we're going to have to make some sacrifices and we're going to have to give some things up to protect what we consider sacred, what we know is sacred. Um, and so, like he mentioned, it was a Tuesday. I don't remember the date. It seems like three years ago already. But it's back in March, um, and he, he texted me at 7 o'clock in the morning, Chuck is going up the mountain. Um, and like I mentioned, I, I teach, I'm a teacher, I teach preschool. Um, so in that situation, fortunately, the pool is only small, and you get nine ohana. Um, that's an unfortunate situation all the time, but on that day, it was actually fortunate. So I don't have the authority, uh, I'm just a teacher, I don't have the authority to close the school. Um, but I do have a phone. And I get everybody's number. And I call all the Ohana one by one, explain the situation, and they know because we've been talking about it in, in Pula, in Halawai, often. This is what's going on in Mount Makiel. And we had a lot of those Ohana actually join us on the day of the, the groundbreaking. So I told them from the, you know, consistently, hey, when, when this starts to go down, don't be surprised if you guys lose a coup. Yeah, and, and with, with all respect, and not, not joking about it, but that's just the seriousness of this, of this situation. So at 7 o'clock, I'm actually on my way to work, driving, I get the text. Oh, what am I going to do? I got to be there. I know this is my kulana, I knew this since October. And so, I get on the phone, I call each ohana one by one. Aloha, you know, roka gayaka, hope things make kai. Uh, I don't have the ability to close the school, but I will ask you all politely, would you mind taking the day off? Would you guys mind keeping your keiki at home? And, and luckily, um, every ohana agreed to. They all kept their keiki home. So if no more kids at school, then you can leave, huh? So <laughs> about five minutes before school is even supposed to start, I got confirmation everybody wasn't coming. And that some of them were actually planning on joining us on the mountain. So went home, uh, changed clothes a little bit, not knowing how the weather was going to be, and got up to the mountain. By the time I got to the mountain, it was about 10 o'clock. Lanakila has got there already. Um, Kuipo Freitas, who was actually another Puma at Arkula, she got the word too, so she was up there already, and they had started walking. Uh, I got there, Lakia Trask was at, the, at the, um, the roadblock because they had blocked the road and they weren't allowing us up, which is why Lanakila and Kuipo decided to walk. So knowing that they were walking and not knowing how far ahead they were, the two of us decided, okay, we're going to wait down here because the guy was telling us that the road will be open pretty soon. So we're going to wait down here, that way we can drive up and we can at least give them a ride back down. Um, that day, there was probably about 15 of us on the mountain by the end of the day. 
Uh, we had some, some conversations with the security guards, kind of figuring out, okay, what's the scoops? Um, trying to figure out, okay, what are our options? What can we do? What can we not do? What's being monitored? What's not being monitored? What do they know? What do they not know? And so talking with the security guards that day, they were in front of the construction site, and we've seen that four, four machines had been set up on the construction site already. And so, you know, Trevor, you get the scoops, asking them, oh, you know, what's your guys' schedule? You guys here 24-7? Or you guys, you guys leave night time? Uh, they told us that they're here 24-7, and their only kuleana is to protect the machines, to make sure no harm is done to those machines. That was the only kuleana. That's all they could do. And then about an hour later, all of a sudden, their kuleana was to monitor vehicles too. And they say, no, you guys kind of have your cars here. You guys got to move it. So we told them, that's not you guys' kuleana. You said your only kuleana is to protect the machines, and they're protected at this point. So they left it at that. About an hour later, they start talking us, okay, if you guys don't move the trucks, we're going to tow it away. And so, what we saw was, again, they explained to us what their kuleana was. So they just tried to kind of gain power over us. Try to give us demands that they know they have no authority to do, and they like see us uh, conform to what they want. And so, all of us told them, do what you gotta do. You gotta call the tow truck, call the tow truck. But there's no signs over here, there's no authority uh, forcing us to move it. You guys said your kuleana is only to protect the machines. And so, we were there that day for, from 10 in the morning to about five in the afternoon, and we decided that we're gonna, you know, for lack of a better word, we're gonna occupy the space. We're gonna, we're gonna shut it down. Yeah, that's where that TMT shutdown hashtag came from. We're gonna shut the TMT down. We're not gonna let them go through with this. Um, so we decided, let's all go home. Let's get one more day of rest. One more day of, you know, get one last good out out in. And then we come up on Thursday morning, uh, which was Kuhio day. Yeah, ironically. Um, we'll come up, we'll come together, and we're gonna, we're gonna stop this. Then the very next morning, at the same time, I got a text again from the Kilo machines are working. And so that was a huge hooky hooky for me, because already the day before, I would ask all the Ohana, yeah, no come school. And as much as I wanted to do that again, I know that I, I couldn't. I kind of sacrificed and, and compromised the integrity of the Kula. So that was a hard day for me. It was the longest day of the week, too. It's a Wednesday, so we get parent class afterwards. So it's basically a 7 to 7 day. Um, but as soon as work was done, I went straight up the mountain. Didn't even think about it. Went to the mountain in shorts, t-shirts, slippers, nighttime. Oh, within two hours, I couldn't feel my feet. Um, <laughs> but uh, luckily, we had some other people there. There was about seven, us, seven of us there that night. Lanakila and I, Kuipo, uh, Krista Allah, Lena Allah, her mom. And that was about it. Started off with a group of seven people. And, um, but we put the call out, okay? Tomorrow, holiday, that's why we chose that day because we wanted to start off our stance with a solid number of people. Yeah, I know they come in with, with eight guys and you know, it doesn't seem like this is a, this is a situation and a, and a movement that everybody doesn't want to be a part of. We wanted to show that, okay, we're, we're united on this, we fought on this, we're gonna come with a solid force. And so for the first day, we probably had about 60 people or so, which in our mind at that point was good right on you know short notice um, but the TMT folks never came they never come that day they never come the following day they never come the following day they never come the following day and then Monday they came and on that day again our numbers weren't, weren't great probably around 60 to 70 people but we we're able to hold them off on the road for eight hours yeah, they, they, they work union good fellow yeah construction union so they got a strict schedule. They work seven in the morning till three in the afternoon. Um, and of course, you know, we get a lot of guys working construction, so we get that information. Um, but they gotta also come earlier because they cannot just shoot it straight up the Mona. They gotta stop, they gotta acclimate because um, there's a lot of people who get altitude sickness and dizziness and things like that. So we kind of anticipated that they'd be coming anywhere between 5.30 and 6.30. So for, those, for all of those days, we were going to sleep at like 1 in the morning because we're on edge, you don't know, you know we don't know are these suckers going to come or not. And we were going to sleep at 1 o'clock in the morning, we waking up at 3.30. Yeah, we just, because we cannot heal it night, we cannot trust, we don't know what they're going to do. Every time when Carl would drive through in the middle of the night, everybody wake up. 
You look, you start looking, you look to the side, the other guy in his car stays sitting up too, the car over there stays sitting up too. So we're all on edge, it was real um, restless nights. And so they came up that Monday, they got there about 6.15 in the morning. And that was one of the, the better feelings of my life, I think. Yeah, because they came full force. All their cars, all their officials, all the construction workers, and a boatload of, of Maka'i, of, of policemen. I'd say at least 40 officers. They came that day. And, and we made a line. And we up, And we didn't allow them through. Um, and, and that energy there was just was amazing. Because again, we didn't have choked people. Yeah, the, the police could have taken us out easily. Guaranteed, a couple hours at the most, Paul. Um, if they really wanted to, they could have taken us out in, in an hour at the most. But um, we handed them some documents that day. And, and that day, and again, you know, we don't know what's going to work. Because um, everything they're doing is illegal anyway. Everything they're doing is flawed. The process has been flawed from the very beginning. But we figure if we can provide them with some documentation, and if you know, they're not just dealing with some ignorant people, that there are, this, this, this is a movement that's going to be at least a little bit founded on education yeah, and, um, and knowledge. If we can provide them with some documentation, maybe we can hold them off for a little while. So that day, we actually provided them with the, with the press release that had come out a few days, of, uh, a few days before that, um, acknowledging the fact that judicial notice was taken in the Maui court case with the Maui fishermen. And so we provided them with the written mandamus as well, which is the 165-page document, and explained to them that you know, they lack jurisdiction and all this kind of stuff, uh, all the stuff that we know. And again, not really with the mana that it would stop them, but hopefully that for a little bit of time it could, it could buy us some time. Yeah, it could buy us some time because the whole thought process in this is that we're not going to stop them in one day. We're not going to stop them in one week, one month, maybe not even one year. This is a one point four billion dollar project. They got money coming from coming out of the nose, coming out of the ears. They got money all over this, and so what it's going to take is a consistent effort. Is a, a the ability to delay them, delay them, delay, delay, delay. And over time, the money's gonna add up, yeah? And even though it's, even though it's $1.4 billion, in some senses, it's only $1.4 billion. That can run up eventually, yeah? It's not everlasting. It's gonna, it'll come to an end. And so if we can provide delays to them, that, that's kind of our strategy. Over time, it'll frustrate them. It'll become a, a waste of time, waste of money we can get them to pull out. And so we provided them with those documentation. We had some, we had some discussions with the policemen, with Wally Ishibashi, who is the cultural advisor to the Office of Mauna Kea Management, uh, with Bob Reckman, who is the head of the archaeology team under ASM affiliates. Um, the cultural monitor was there, and, and a few of us who had kind of been designated the spokespeople of the group. And so we had a conversation, and, and we had a microphone too. We had a sound system. Because we didn't want them talking with just a small group of us. Because one thing that we've acknowledged this whole time is that this is not an organizational effort. This is not a hui thing. This is not a, a what group you're a part of. The only group that we're a part of is the la hui. Yeah, if you gotta give us a title, then we say, okay, then you call us aloha aina. There's no groups to this. And so we didn't wanna, we didn't feel it proper to just have a select few in this meeting. That it should be heard by everybody. And so we actually had a sound system on the mount on the mount now, and everybody who gave statements was able to do it onto the microphone, and everybody else on the road who was blocking the road could hear it and respond. Uh, so our, our our side, we all went around, we gave a statement, we explained to them how this is illegal, how this is improper, how this is not adhering to the, the eight criteria, it's not adhering to the laws of occupation and international law, it's not adhering to, it's not recognizing the rights of the people, and and it's detrimental to the Aina. So we go ahead and do all that kind of stuff, and it comes to their turn to give their statement. Because we were told that this is gonna be a meeting. We're gonna have a hollow vibe. We're gonna exchange documentation. They're gonna provide us with the contracts. They're gonna provide us with the statements and all those kind of stuff so that we can, we can double check all of those things. And in turn, we're gonna provide them with our documentation. We gave them ours, they gave us nothing. Wally Ishibashi went ahead and, and his statement was very short, straight to the point. He said, we respect you guys, Manao, but this is not up to us to decide. This is for the courts to decide. And, and we all know, 
never work for us. Never has. And as long as we stay in this system, it never will. And so, um, we didn't accept that. He passed it on to the, the archaeologist who had said that he would um, share some dialogue with us and discuss with us. And all he said was, off the microphone, I have no comment. And that was the end of that. So from that point, we went ahead and we discussed with the policemen. But you know, um, that whole day, they got there at 6.15 in the morning. We held them off on the road. They stayed on the road. They never go home early. They stayed there until 2.51 p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah, nine minutes before Paul Hanna. And at that point, they started moving and they turned around. And the energy among the people was incredible. People started chanting, people started singing. And that was one of the, you know, in my short lifetime, that was one of the greatest moments of my life. Yeah, that, that at least for one day, even though it was only one day, a small group of people was able to put a stop to a project that's backed by five countries and $1.4 billion dollars with the assistance of the police, with the assistance of DLNR and DoCare and all of those people, we were able to stop them. You know, although only for one day, but that was a, that was a good start. Yeah, can, get, can I get off to a better start than that? The following day, they didn't come. The following day, they didn't come. And then Thursday, they came. And that's when all of the arrests were made. And also on, on those days, we still had about maybe, I'd say, 60, 70 people, max. 31 arrests were made. Yeah, so just about half the group, about. Uh, I was arrested that morning as well. I was part of the first group taken out. And uh, Lana Keela and I had discussed that, you know, one of us can get arrested, one has to make sure we stay on the mountain. So I told him, okay, I go first. I'll get arrested first, you can go tomorrow. Um, and so I got taken out with the first group, and it was pretty quick. Got taken out about 7.30 in the morning, you know, only half an hour after it was to start work. So that was a huge uh, disappointment, you know, that was, that was too easy. That was too easy, that was too fast. Um, and there's 12 of us. And so at that time, we had discussed, we had a hollow bite, who's willing to get arrested? Whoever's willing to get arrested, let's go to the side, let's figure out, make sure we get bail money, make sure we get plans, all that kind of stuff. And so we had only basically 11 people who said we're willing to get arrested. And so they took all 12 of us out that, at that point. So as they're taking us to the cars, we're thinking, they're gonna do work today. They're gonna do work today. And as we're getting walked down to the paddy wagon, there's a small uh, group of keiki from Alokeho Aina Mauna, Hawaiian Charter School in Waimea. And they were chanting to us as we were taken out. They were watching us and they were chanting to us. And, and that was a powerful moment too. Yeah, because there's, a, there's Makua and Ohana who didn't try to censor this from their keiki. They exposed them to it. And the keiki were there and chanting. Chanting for those of us who are being taken away, which most times would, um, would portray a negative image, yeah? Something you don't want your keiki to go through and support. But they were there, they were chanting. And we got taken into the room, we could hear them chanting the whole time. And all I could think about the whole time was, they're going up to the mauna and they're going to start doing destruction. And so it was a real tough half hour or so. We get put in the car, we're getting taken away. And we're looking out the window, and as we pull onto the road, we see that the line of cars had progressed up the Mauna, but that they were being blocked again. There was a whole group of people a little further up the Mauna that had been blocked, and so that was an awesome feeling to be kept taken away and see that, okay, they never get there yet, and they're not gonna get there. And so we're able to hold them off for six hours that day. Um, they did go ahead and do some work, I think it was about two to three hours. But up until this point, from the day that we first started there, Today makes one month, four weeks to the day. And in these four weeks, they've only been able to do about three hours of work. So not even an hour a week. And so again, that's, that's gonna build up. It's gonna, um, it's gonna accumulate. Yeah, and every day, they're losing money. Every day, they're losing time in this race for the largest telescope in the world. Even though we know that Chile already has two telescopes that are gonna be larger than this. Um, but, that's how it started, and from that day, the very next day on the Mauna, we had over about 300 people. Yeah, those arrests ignited the people. It sparked this, this i'ini, this ahi inside of everybody's na'au to go ahead and be a part of this. And that was one of the big uh, huki-wuki, because 
for me, I was determined. Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to get arrested, but if it comes down to it, I, I go and get arrested. That's what it takes. Um, but there are some people who are trying to convince us that that's not a good idea. It's going to scare people away. What's the point of that? All they do is take you off the mountain and now they can go ahead and do work. But I was sure that if we could stay in the Kapuolo and if we could continue to do this in a proper way, that it would ignite our people. And I think what we've seen since then, in my estimation, is the greatest activation, mobilization, and unification of the Hawaiian people since 1897. Yeah? And so um, that's something that it, it did spark something. Um, and since then, the, the presence has been consistent. 24-7, some nights we get 60 guys staying over. Um, and it continues to get stronger. We continue to get more numbers. We continue to get more people. And so all of these strategies of, because what we think is that they're not, the first moratorium, when they came out, they said it was kind of in respect for the Merry Monarch. It wasn't in respect for the Merry Monarch. It was in fear of the Merry Monarch. Because who comes with the Merry Monarch? Hula dancers, cultural practitioners, Kanaka, yeah, who all hold this mount of sacred. And so I think what they thought they could do is they could stall, delay, and this ahi, this iini, this desire would fizzle out. And the people would slowly start to separate, start to go back to, to real life. But they were greatly mistaken. And throughout the week, numbers started to grow. Numbers continued to grow. And so I'm not sure what their tactics are, what their purpose is, but any efforts to slow this movement down and to stall momentum and, and kill the progress that's been made has failed, has absolutely failed. And the numbers up there continue to get stronger, continue to get new people, and I'm confident that um, we'll stay on that path. So, Kalamai, that's kind of the long version of the, the couple minutes I thought I was going to talk up here. Um, we'll be back up here later, but that's how everything got started. So, mahalo nui. Mahalo. We are live right outside Oha headquarters, Gentry Pacific Center, 560 North Nimitz. Aloha. Aloha.